Oh, perfect. Oh, gives you a nice little message there to let you know it's, it's being recorded. All right, well then, let's get started. Everyone, thank you and welcome to one of our Goldmine Project events. Before we begin though, uh, in, in the spirit of reconciliation, we would like to acknowledge that we live, work, and play on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy. That's it, Sika, Kaina, Pekani, the Sutina, the Stony Nakoda Nations, Mady Nations, Region 3. And for all of us who make our homes here in Calgary, we are living in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. For those of you returning, we're happy to see you again. And for those of you who are new to the GMP, we are excited to have you. So for those of you who are new, just to let you know, we are a nonprofit that is entirely volunteer run. Uh, and our key mission, I like to shorten it down to uh, professionals helping professionals get back to work. So what does that mean? Essentially the, G uh, the GMP, <laughs> that's me being German. <laughs> um, the GMP, we focus monthly or we try to focus monthly on highlighting local tools for job search and mental health, which has been a really big topic for the last two years, as you can imagine with, with COVID. Resources for job search, uh, job opportunities and industry information. So this particular presentation will be one of our industry information sessions. Our focus is usually on helping people who are unemployed, underemployed, or uh, transitioning in their career, but that doesn't mean that all of our content is only useful for them. Today is a really good example of a topic that is for anyone and everyone. So before we begin, I wanna just go over some of the housekeeping items. Today's session will be about an hour long. I'm so sorry if you saw otherwise, I hear there was a little bit of a blip on Eventbrite, but uh, Andrea will go through her presentation and then we'll open up the floor to questions. And we expect this to run for about an hour. But I don't think that the conversation has to stop there and I encourage it not to. I always like to tell people to reach out to us on LinkedIn or the speakers on LinkedIn or to people that you see in the conversation uh, in the chat and continue the conversation because at least you know that you have one thing in common and that is this topic. Uh, we will be recording as I mentioned previously so you can if you miss bits of this or uh, or you have to leave early, you can go back and view this on our YouTube channel that is called The Goldmine Project. Please follow and subscribe if you're interested. Uh, you, If you've missed some of our events or you're just uh, joining us today for the first time, you can see some of our really awesome events that we've had in last year or this year. We've just started doing this for COVID, so it's only been the last two years. Um, events like, they're kind of funny, some of the funny topics are when you start looking for job opportunities and end up playing Candy Crush. So <laughs> I'd say go take a look. There's some pretty good content on there. Uh, as for presentation slides, we will be sending them out hopefully within the next five days. So you can uh, you can be sure that to have those. Um, and again, just another note, please mute your sound, but we do encourage video. And if you have questions, please no, uh, please note them in the chat box and I will be going through them at the end. All right, so now to introduce our wonderful speaker, Andrea Pell with VDE. And as promised, she will be educating us on hydrogen. So Andrea is or has her master's in environmental management and a bachelor's in environmental engineering. During her study, she got in touch with the hydrogen topic through several of her topics. And with that experience, she started working on the strategy and hydrogen roadmap for VDE as a project manager for hydrogen. So not only is she formed the role of hydrogen within VDE group, but also within society and industry. But I'll leave it to her to explain a little bit more about what that means and who VDE is. So welcome, Andrea. Thank you very much, uh, Marika. It's a pleasure to be here. And I hope I be telling uh, new things to, to every one of you on about hydrogen, just so that you have some knowledge, some basic knowledge about it. And um, yeah, that you can discuss, or maybe that it even gives you more interest into the topic so that you uh, dig a little bit deeper. And yeah, I uh, started looking into the topic of hydrogen when, during my studies, uh, because I had a wonderful professor. Um, she is really keen on going deep into the topic and um, developing it for, for, for Europe, mainly for Germany. And, and then I thought after my studies that I have to, to, to completely understand um, hydrogen. I should um, first look into the, the renewable production of 
hydrogen, so the green production, so that I understand it better. And this is why I started working at ABO Wind, and then um, I switched to VDE, which, which uh, is an association. They make norms and standards mainly, um, and they also do um, consulting projects and studies on the field um, and many, many other fields, mobility to just name one. And yeah, so this is where I started in January. Right, perfect. Andrea, we just had some comments that your audio is a little bit low. Is it possible to okay. either speak a little bit louder or perhaps, oh, perfect, you've got speakers. Great, <laughs> sorry. No, don't worry, don't worry. Alrighty. Perfect. Maybe we can test that and then some of the people who had mentioned that audio was low, if you can just let me know if that works better. Is it working better? Just let me know. Yeah, okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Great. Sorry for that. Thank you. No worries, thank you so much. Okay, so um, let's dive into the topic. Hydrogen, um, is it the solution for everything? Um, it's a tiny element, which I'm going to talk about because it's uh, yeah the, the tiniest in our in our chemical um, elements in our universe, but also the most frequent. And it has some um, some some um, applications that are really interesting for many things of our daily work or of our daily life. And this is why many countries in the world currently develop hydrogen strategies. Um, I quoted three points of the Canadian hydrogen strategy and one of the German one. So in Canada, so Canada uh, is um, one of the tap, top um, 10 hydrogen producers in the world today. And this is why Canada thinks that they can also be um, a major exporter in the future. And that leads to about 50 billion domestic revenues. This is what they, the, what the hydrogen strategy expects in the future. And yeah. For a moment, um, your PowerPoint's not showing for us at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I was waiting for a quick pause to tell you that again. <laughs> okay. I think why is it not because it's up. when you put your tells that you I'm get. I'm showing it. Just oh, too funny. Zoom. Um, Let's try again. Okay. Sorry. No worries. There, you go, there we go. Perfect. We there are we all go. set now. Good. Okay. So hydrogen solution for everything, question mark. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is what I was talking about first. So we, uh, Canada says it's one of the top producers today, 10 top producers in uh, of hydrogen today. And um, this is why also Canada thinks that it will be in the future as well, so that um, Canada will export a lot of hydrogen to the world um, in a revenues of $50 billion um, dollars, um, for it by 2050, and it will reduce the emissions in, in Canada as well. And it will create jobs, about 350,000. Um, this is what they, they say in the strategy. Germany um, thinks of the hydrogen application or integration in a, I would say, in a very, very broad way. So it means that they say that green hydrogen and, and hydrogen in general will have a global impact on emissions. And even if the tiny country Germany um, converts to hydrogen applications, it will have a big impact on climate change mitigation in the world. Um, hydrogen could be a perfect fit for sector coupling. That's a question um, because there are certainly many, many obstacles, but I will come to that later. Just now I want to focus on what we can do or how we can actually combine and do sector coupling with hydrogen. So you will have, or we will have, um, the hydrogen production, mainly that's the future way of thinking with um, green power. And then you will convert it to the, the, the you will convert water into 
into hydrogen and you can apply the hydrogen so which will be then an e-fuel you will apply it in in the heat market in in steel production in chemical industry for example as a fertilizer which will then have an impact on agriculture you can also apply it in the petrochemical industry and in mobility applications but it will also be or it can also be applied in the electric grid as a um, frequency frequency stabilizer for example um, the precise scope of application is not fixed yet and the exact application impacts are currently examined um, why i say that is the reason why i say that is because currently we only have few green hydrogen which will have the highest emission reduction um, impact and this is why everybody here on the consumers or on the applicant side is fighting for okay i want to have the green hydrogen i want to have the the clean the low emission hydrogen to bring my emissions down because of um because of national emission reduction goals that i think most countries have right now and then yeah this this slide shows i think pretty well that you have interconnections between all of the sectors so sometimes you have hydrogen as a byproduct and then you can use it to, in another sector so hydrogen oh maybe one slide back so um, the 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 point here says that you can either use it electrically or chemically and i will go a little bit deeper into those points right now so if you use it as electrical um ap application or utilization that means um, that you apply it in the electricity market. Um, why is that? Because the higher the share of volatile renewable energies, the higher is the need for storage capacity to stabilize the system. And the reason behind that is the demand and the supply aren't always synchronized in time. And this is crucial to have a reliable network. Otherwise, your network will break down because you always have to, you know, consume the electricity that is injected in the same time. Um, and that is why we need storage applications that are jumping in if we have such huge peaks of PV production, for example, and that um, then consume or convert into storage or into, um, in this case, into hydrogen to be able to keep the system running. Then um, we have an issue that we cannot, so, so this, is, this is Germany and we have an issue here that we have our industries, so to say, in the middle and the, the power conversion, um, the power plants are mainly in the north and in the south, of course, we, have, we do have it in the middle as well. And we used to, uh, even more because our coal power plants are here in the middle. And this is why the huge industries are also in the middle, uh, located in the middle. Um, and the thing about that is that you have energy losses over distance and that we have problems transporting the electricity down to where it's needed. And hydrogen, so if you convert the electricity to hydrogen, you can transport it easier. So hydrogen can with hydrogen you can transport elect, uh, energy over larger distances this is one big advantage of hydrogen and if you have it injected into into the gas grid and i i learned that uh, also canada has a very broad um, gas grid then you can easily do the sector coupling and you can also apply hydrogen in the heat market then hydrogen in the transport sector here you kind of have electrical and chemical utilization. It depends on what propulsion system you will apply. Um, today we think, or let me put it this way, we, we discuss still if we put hydrogen in a combustion engine or in a um, fuel cell vehicle. And this is why it's chemical or electrical application. And you can also put hydrogen in, um, in ships, in trains, and in trucks. And cars, 
currently the the direction is actually that we don't want to focus on applying hydrogen in in private cars because the efficiency is not as good if you, um, as if you use um, battery electric vehicles. So whenever you have to whenever you have to convert the energy in, a, in another energy carrier, for instance, hydrogen, then you have energy losses and this is what we don't want. And um, this is also something I could say about, um, about all industries, all industries that cannot be electrified directly um, should or could use hydrogen, but if they can be electrified directly, it's better to do that. The same goes for for mobility. So, um, for for a battery electric car, you just have much less efficiency losses, and therefore you don't need as much electricity and energy to um, to move. Instead of when you use hydrogen, where you have to convert it, and the conversion brings um, quite quite still quite high um, energy losses although it's better than a combustion engine for um, the ramp up of hydrogen technologies it could be that we still look on um, look on private cars because well many of us drive a car and um, this brings then uh, certainly the, the mass production and brings down the costs and then we can also apply it for for trucks and trains in a cheaper way just as a side note, um, there are some, some recordings or some mappings of where we have um, hydrogen fuels, fueling stations in the world. And um, I, on the left-hand side, you see the one from, from Canada and um, US America. And on the right-hand side, it's, uh, it's Europe. And Germany is actually one of the countries where we have the highest um, amount of, of hydrogen fueling stations, which is, um, I think, quite quite amazing because we always had the, the hen egg problem. So um, the car manufacturers said, well, we don't have the infrastructure to, um, to supply our cars. And the infrastructure side said, yeah, well, we don't have the cars to where we, uh, for what we build our infrastructure for. And the infrastructure is also quite expensive, so they need consumers in order to get a payoff, a payback. Then we have another look on the on the um, on the industry side, on the industry application. And here, like I said, whenever you can directly electrify the the industry, use that. But whenever you you cannot do that. For example, for for steel, um, you will use um, the the hydrogen chemically. So you really have the, the you really need the chemical um, components of the yeah the chemical components of hydrogen to to produce steel. Or um, yeah, otherwise it's not possible with um, with electricity because currently where they need carbon. And it, the carbon will be replaced by hydrogen, and that will bring down the emissions. And this is why direct electrification is not the best way to do here. Um, and this is a slide showing um, 2019 where we currently use hydrogen already, and it's um, refining ammonia, a little bit of transport, methanol, and all these. Um, and the the production side is natural gas, coal, and oil, and some of them electricity, and that will be then via a electrolyzer. Um, let's have a look on the hydrogen goals, and then I'll go deeper into what pathways we have to produce hydrogen. So Canada says it's a unique starting point because it's already a global leader of hydrogen and uh, fuel cell sector. And that is, that is quite, quite good. And like I said, um, one of the top 10 hydrogen producers in the world today. And um, you have large blue hydrogen production possibilities. 
Here on the right hand side, you see um, the production. You have, um, you have natural gas, you have nuclear renewables and large scale hydro, um, hydroelectric. And then on the right, on the very right, you see the end use. And here they, um, the, the hydrogen strategy of Canada shows where they think you can do what. Um, so where you can build which production, um, which production possibility. So I already talked a little bit about the production um, possibilities or pathways, and here they are listed. And um, you, yeah, let's let's go a little bit deeper in this. So we have some geological deposits, um, but we cannot really access them right now. So there we have pure hydrogen and we could like, like uh, for instance, um, uh, natural gas um, deposits or oil deposits. But today we don't really use them. We don't have access to them. Then we have the possibility to um, produce um, red hydrogen. That means we have um, atomic energy and use this um, to, to run electrolyzers. So that will label it as red hydrogen. Then we have, um, let's jump a little bit to, to the left, to, we have gray hydrogen. So there the source is oil or coal or natural gas. And we have steam reforming. Um, and from this steam reforming, we will just collect the, the hydrogen, and um, then of course we have emissions. With the emissions, we can do actually a blue hydrogen application. That means we can um, store, uh, capture and store the, the carbon, so the CO2 that is coming out, or we even utilize it, for instance, in, um, in greenhouses, in, in, yeah, for, for um, plants, to grow plants in, in greenhouses. And then you have also the possibility to do it via the Turkey's um, hydrogen production. And there we have as a byproduct, so to say, solid carbon in the end, after um, cracking the same, like it's the same source like in the gray hydrogen production, but we just collect the, the carbon of it and we'll store it somehow or we'll use it somehow differently so that we don't blow the emissions out into our atmosphere. And then we have the green hydrogen production. And this is where we, most of the strategies in the world want to go for. So they say this is, this is the, the main goal in the future to bring down our, our emissions because then we will use green um, uh, renewable energies combined with the electrolyzers and then we have green hydrogen and no um, emissions or let's say no emissions is not really possible <laughs> but lower very very low emissions um, a little bit of examples from canadian companies looking into um, or, or not only canadian but ca um, companies in canada that um, already work in the hydrogen sector. It's Erdi Keed, it's uh, Ballard Power Systems and HTEC. So um, Erdi Keed, I think it's uh, is known, they already have some PEM electrolyzers um, in, in, installed in, in Canada and they want to um, increase their production capacity in the future, in the near future. Ballard um, is is a fuel cell um, production company for buses, for trucks, and also for light trains. And IHTEC, they want to build the infrastructure, um, clean production, fueling stations, and logistics. The main takeaways, um, we have essential chances by applying hydrogen into our electric system into our overall system as i said it's kind of it's it's sector coupling so really combining all the all the sectors together um 
I, I hear some voice and I cannot really <laughs> mute it. <laughs> Maybe the person who's unmuted. Um, no, it ah, doesn't work. Okay, well, I'll just go on. So um, we have the possibilities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, of our human activity. So that's called decarbonization. If we apply green hydrogen in the in the long perspective but there are also fights about that like many discussions is this really the solution to apply it right right now or can we also go for blue hydrogen for a little bit and then convert to to green hydrogen so many experts are thinking okay it should be green from the beginning so we need to switch now the pressure is there and this is what can bring us really the decarbonization. Um, hydrogen can be a suitable interface for sector coupling and um, large integration of renewables. So that means that the German energy vendor is then possible because with battery systems only, um, it will be a little bit difficult, so to say, to, to, to do both, to do sector coupling and to do the large integration of renewables. Because also experts say that the more renewables you have in the system, um, like I said one, at that one point, the more capacities for storage you need. And there, hydrogen is a quite good um, storage application. Um, it will ideally, uh, ideally, it will support um, in stabilizing electric grids. Um, like I said in the beginning, in if you, you have to have the system always in balance. And um, it will definitely design and develop new markets worldwide. And um, this will also bring me to the obstacles, the last obstacle listed here. Um, it will bring geopolitical, geopolitical changes where we don't know yet where it's going to go. Because currently we have our energy systems or worldwide energy systems um, developed like this, that we have the oil and gas um, um, supply by some countries in the world. That might change because they might not have the same possibilities for hydrogen production, but they are working currently on it. Um, for example, Saudi Arabia and and um, Norway, but it will it will bring some change, and we don't know where, how, and how, where it's going. So this is one obstacle, and we need to have that in mind. And I can say that the German government is currently building up um, from the embassy side some ambassador positions to really focus on that topic. Um, the characteristics of uh, hydrogen make the transportation and the storage dif difficult. I said at one point, yeah, hydrogen is um, a better way to, to transport energy over long distances. Yes, that's right. But still, hydrogen is very, um, mm, ex uh, what, what is the word? Um, it likes to ex escape. So it's diffuse um, and this is why it's also uh, yeah quite difficult to keep it it's very reactive and so hydrogen pure hydrogen doesn't like to stay pure hydrogen so to say from a chemical side and that's why it's difficult to transport it then we also need to take care of carbon leakage um, because it can happen at many stages also a geopolitical topic um, that means, for example, for Germany, it's quite important to import large amounts of hydrogen um, because we don't really can we, we can't really um, supply ourselves with energy, and we want to have um, we we want to achieve hard, large um, emission reduction goals and. To ensure this, we certainly need green hydrogen. And if we import green hydrogen, 
we need to know that this hydrogen is really green and not gray. And that means that in the country where we exp import it from, they need um, green power. So that's, it's, yeah, it's a very difficult point there. And um, the supply certainly, like I said, in Germany needs to be insured uh, from externally because otherwise the steel production might not have hydrogen and then they cannot produ produce steel. And the costs have to be on an affordable level for all sectors. Yeah, otherwise you will have the risk of losing industry sectors in the countries. Um, hydrogen is currently quite expensive, especially, especially green hydrogen. And if you integrate green hydrogen into your steel production, this, the steel will cost more. And yeah, you know what happens then. If the steel costs less in another in another country, then of course you will. Most of them tend to buy the cheaper one. So there is a lot going on currently, and um, many obstacles or yeah occurring day after day. But also the chances are growing, and it's a very so nothing is graved in stone. Um, I would I, I don't want to say nothing that I said is graved in stone, but many things are really moving fast. And um, they are developing and it's really, really interesting. So yeah, now we have time for discussion and, and questions and I look forward to it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Andrea. This is definitely a topic that is so complex and just like every new industry, it's, it's always moving. So I really appreciate you having such a broad knowledge on the topic, especially coming from Germany and knowing hydrogen industry more so worldwide. Um, so it's nice having an outside perspective on hydrogen here too and hearing that we're, we're already uh, a country that has pretty advanced hydrogen production. I think that's that's pretty cool to hear. Um, we do have a couple questions already and I'm sure more will trickle in, but first we had one, it's from Al and says, Angia, where would you rate a company like Proton Technologies in Canada who are producing hydrogen via in situ combustion? I assume that they'll have minimal em uh, emissions as the decarbonization is happening underground. So. Yeah. Um... Uh, I, I had a look on that, a very short one on Proton um, Technologies. And well, yeah, if if they are able to, to keep the CO2 emissions in a circle, then I would say, why not, right? Um, but whenever you need to, whenever you need fossil fuels to, to produce hydrogen, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not so sure about that because then we still rely on fossil fuels and we want to get rid of them in the future. And this is why um, many people just, just yesterday, I went to um, a very interesting discussion discussion from politics and, and researchers in Germany. And there was also the discussion on the table. So should we in, invest in blue hydrogen and apply it right now because it's easier um, to, to apply it right now and we have we, we would have it really fast we can use it right now so or or is it better to go for green hydrogen right away and there it's really the the question so shall we invest for an interim technology blue hydrogen in large amounts and shut them down after 10 years even though the investment is maybe not even even paid back right so you do, you did not make any any progress with that or not and there are so it's a really hot topic right now and um very difficult to to yeah to give to give to give a definite answer on that that's very fair well i'll leave it to al if he has any other comments he can put them in the yeah chat. definitely i hope yeah. i answered the question <laughs> I think so. I mean, again, this is the kind of topic that's really hard to, to set something in stone, right? It's uh, a new industry and every new industry is just constantly moving parts. So I think you did well. Uh, the next question we had was Gary, the company called Hydrogen Source in Norway. Has anybody had dealings with the company or know of them? Have you happened to heard of them? 
No, actually not. I, I haven't heard of them, no. Okay. I assume they um, they are a blue hydrogen producer. Yeah, that's, I've never but, heard. Yeah, of Gary, just give us more details about that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, next one was Brandon. He said, great presentation. And in, Thank you. <laughs> in Germany, are you seeing hydrogen being transported via retrofitted pipelines or are new hydrogen pipelines being built? Good question. Um, and also a very big discussion. <laughs> so, well, there are a couple of things there. So some say it's not a problem at all to just um, uh, to just um, retrofit it. So the current um, natural gas pipelines that we have can easily be transferred to hydrogen um, pipelines. Currently, there are um, there are experiments to increase the hydrogen um, amount percentage in the pipelines. So it's most of the time possible to have 10% hydrogen in the pipelines. And now they make um, experiments with 15 and 20% and see how that goes. The problem is that hydrogen could, um, ah, what is the word? Um, it could lead to corrosion in in the pipelines because it's a different it's a different gas and it could also um, um, de dilute through the the pipelines and that is something we don't want because then we have losses um, this is why some say oh, this is one reason why some say no we definitely need hydrogen pipelines just for hydrogen only um, and there is, so it's not answered the question. There are many researchers, like I said, working on that, seeing how it goes, also looking into the financial perspective and the, the market perspective, what would be the most beneficial one um, to do that? Because if you build such an, such an infrastructure, I mean, it's huge and they need to start it right now if they want to have the hydrogen um, um, supply very soon and if you like the German um, hydrogen strategy is quite different from the from the Canadian one we have quite strict goals also combined to the um, climate protection um, law that is currently um, being even more strictened uh, strictened even more and um, yeah so the combination of both really puts pressure on the industry, on both like the, in, the hydrogen industry and the industry itself, who wants to use and um, yeah, apply hydrogen in the end. So it's a very good question and I'm afraid nobody has the answer yet. All right. I'm going to ask uh, Joanne if he thinks that that might have covered his topic as well, because the next question was, what are the obstacles in converting LG NGL pipeline infrastructure to transport hydrogen? For example, yeah. steel properties of the pipeline. So I, I, yeah, he just said, yes, it did. So um, that's all the questions that I have in here, but I actually have a question for you. Sure. Uh, and, and maybe you touched on this and I was just distracted with the chat, but you had talked about uh, the private vehicles not necessarily being a, I would say a viable market just because of the, um, I guess the efficiency of going with hydrogen over just direct electric. Now here in Alberta, we tend to have a lot of heavy duty vehicles. We are a province that really loves big, big, yeah, big cars. <laughs> exactly. Do you think that would change if we're, if we're now, if we're now using a lot of energy to power our vehicles or even just heavy duty machinery, does that change? Would your opinion change on that? Um, so we will have, nah. no, that's also <laughs> too hard to say that. Um, I assume, or many experts assume that we will apply hydrogen propulsion in vehicles in general. Yes, in the future. Um, and most of them will be in heavy duty because for small ones, um, like you can see in this, um, in this graph here, um, you, you will always need a battery, the tank, 
uh, so the hydrogen tank and the fuel cell. And the this is also something I had to learn, and I think everybody had to learn that you always need the battery, and the battery is even um, getting larger right now because the fuel cell lives um, shorter if you have um, if you run it not frequent enough. So that means um, if you just want to go fast, really, like if you want to accelerate really fast, then of course the hydrogen, uh, uh, the, the fuel cell um, power is ramping up and the fuel cell, it doesn't like that. It does like smooth, constant um, utilization. And this is why you have the battery in between. So the fuel cell will most of the time um, run the battery and the battery will then run the electric motor. I know it's a little bit misleading in this in this um, chart, um, but this is, and it's even, the direction currently is even more into the battery will be bigger and um, to have the, the fuel cell constantly running. This, I think, gives an idea why electric, so the battery electric um, version also is more, beneficial in a way of efficiency and also like I said the conversion um, issues so if you convert from pure electricity and um, have an electrolyzer they have a um, efficiency of 70 percent roundabout but there are studies saying differently and it depends on which kind of electrolyzer you're using because there are mainly four um, four types that you can use and then also, if you convert it back via a fuel cell, you will again have um, efficiency losses. And this is why you will most of the time apply it in big utility um, vehicles and also the ones where it's really difficult to electrify it directly. So for a truck or a train or a ship, it's difficult to have today it's difficult to be propelled by batteries only but it can also be that batteries will even um, improve more and that you will then say hey the battery is not as heavy anymore and i don't need that much space and charging is no problem at all anymore so then it could also be a change again so that we will also apply it for for heavy duty I, I hope that uh, I was talking a lot. I hope that I came to the point where I answered the question. <laughs> yeah, no, that that gives me a little bit better idea of how how that would be integrated and, and the um, the different variables that go along with that. So I guess this kind of touched again on one of Yoan's questions. It was, can you elaborate on the biggest storage options available, like salt caverns? That one here come up so maybe maybe you could talk a little bit more about that if you if you know mm -hmm. yes i can um there is i would say not too much research there right now or practical um, knowledge um in germany they're developing currently um a pilot project for that and in Norway, they're, I would say, a little bit more advanced. I'm not sure about it, Canada, to be, to be honest. Um, and I happened to meet a lady that is working on the microbiological um, activity in such storage. And she said that micro by, um, ah, what is it? Bi microbiological activity is quite, is quite high in those caverns and that leads to losses. So the um, the bacteria are eating the hydrogen and then you have losses. And this is also something pretty new that is not very well known and we need to see how we can deal with that. Um, and certainly we need to um, do pilot projects right now to, to know how many Mm, losses we have by converting so because you need pumps to put the to 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 pump the hydrogen into the ground and then again to get it to to get it up you um 
you, you have pumps again that will have losses, um, that will cause losses as well. And um, yeah, so that, that's not solved um, either. I don't know if Canada is more advanced in this direction, because I think the, the underground, um, so the geological um, situation is a little bit better than in Germany. Um, but yeah, that's something I should look up. <laughs> Thank you for the question. <laughs> yeah, we got, we've got lots of questions too now. They're kind of rolling in. That's uh, good. <laughs> this is perfect that we had, this is Let's Talk uh, Hydrogen. It's not just a presentation. I love this kind of format. Okay, so uh, Zane had asked, could you please introduce white hydrogen a little more, like the in, in the deep sea, as you were discussing? Um, maybe what does he mean with this? Yeah, I just touched a little bit on that. Um, to be honest, I don't know that much about it. Um, but there, so like I said, it's it's like natural gas and in in caverns there, and uh, or like oil, and we could drill holes and make get access to it. But I don't really know how we could do that and um, how the research situation is um, going into this direction uh, because, yeah, mainly because in Germany there is not really white hydrogen available. And this is why everybody is just discussing, okay, is it, is it green or is it blue or is it turquoise or uh, gray or what do we do? <laughs> or do we import it all or how much... Uh, percentage uh, do it or yeah how much do we need to import and how can we do that and how's the geopolitical situation changing so um sorry for that um but also a good point for myself to to look deeper into that that's fantastic well and, and just for the the audience to know i am planning hopefully she'll say yes uh to have another hydrogen talk maybe beginning of next year or the end of this year to dive a little bit deeper into these conversations so any of these questions that that andrea can't answer today maybe in the future she will be able to so so just yes mind. <laughs> and andrea i'm just sorry drop me. I'm just yeah, don't down. worry <laughs> no, no, don't, don't worry. Just uh, whenever you have questions uh, that I didn't answer now and you want them to be answered, reach out to me on LinkedIn or drop me a mail and um, I'll, I'll look into that. Awesome. You're the best. Okay. Jason had asked, can we compare water treatments as byproduct capture uh, slash cycle between green and blue hydrogen? And then he said, or discuss a bit about hydride storage. I think the term you were searching for instead of corrosion is embrittlement. Okay. There's other right. There, but. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's true. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, embrittlement, not, not corrosion. Um, so the, the byproduct thing, um, compare water treatments as a byproduct. I'm not sure if I understand the question completely. Maybe you can add a little bit on, on that, Jason. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Um, oh, there you go. Perfect. Yeah. Sorry if the question wasn't perfectly clear. The um, electrolysis for green energy um, purifies water and requires inputs that be electrolytic water. So it's widely known that it can be oceanic water, and people have in mind that it can help with ocean water desalination. Yeah. So I wanted to ask about how that compares with red hydrogen, if it is much of a difference maker, like green to red, or what you see in terms of water treatments, um, as well as the fact that water vapor is uh, a climate ingredient. It's not a pure greenhouse gas linear sense, but it's a contributor to the greenhouse gas effect in certain situations. So I wanted to open up that, ask about yeah. that, about what you see in it. Yeah, thank you for the question. So um, first, there, the 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 water that you need for the electrolysis needs to be quite pure. So in order to have long, so the electrolyzer live long, because if you if you can do it with with uh, saline water, you can also do it with um, with lake water, but then your electrolyzer will break quite soon, I'd say. 
Um, I don't have numbers uh, after how many years. It also depends on, on how frequently you run it. But most of the time, people say, okay, we need drinking water quality or even better. And that's an issue. And this is something people are, so researchers are looking into because they say, we cannot do that. We need water even more than elect, uh, than energy, right? So we need uh, water for, for everything. We, we cannot abandon um, everything else um, or put everything on, on highest prior, everything that concerns energy and forget about our nutrition. So it's definitely a very interesting and very, very demanding topic because also you probably know that um, Germany and, and um, Nigeria, uh, Morocco, they are thinking, okay, so we, we, put the, we put our hydrogen projection in the desert and um, because there we have a very good, um, very good sun um, irradiation and so we can produce a lot of hydrogen and then transport it. So that's very good. But then you have the water issue. And this is something people are always questioning here in Germany. They say, so is it really that good? Like, is it? <laughs> Can't you think of something else um, because of the water issue? Um, then again, you can say, okay, I put it right next to the, to the sea. And you, put a, you add a desalin desalinization um, power plant. But then you have the issue that you will have efficiency losses even more because you need then also electricity to, to run the desalinization. And then, yeah, that's also a contradiction here and uh, an issue that or obstacle that you need to solve. Uh, what was the last part? You said something about, um, say it again, sorry. <laughs> you, you asked about the Distilled water I, I, captured at the end. Well, you're saying how if you use distilled water for electrolysis, that your uh, anode and cathode will last longer. The metals won't won't be worn down as quickly by the impurities, right? Yes. Dissolved solids. Yes. Um, electrolysis with a lot of um, electrolytic dissolved solids in it, um, like gray water, for example, or ocean water. Um, has a demand to be treated that is is typically seen as a cost or a, a, another goal, a secondary goal. And so the value of distilled water is obvious, I think. And yes. the byproduct behind a hydrogen fuel cell produces uh, distilled water vapor. Um, is there a lot of emphasis on capturing that vapor of distilled water or no? Uh, yes, there is, and in Germany uh, there even is uh, a law. I don't, I cannot translate it. Sorry for that. Um, that also hinders the application of electrolyzers to really build them up. And um, yeah, so also there still discussions how to solve that issue, how to solve um, the the byproduct. Um, is it is it like just putting it into the lakes, which is not a good. Um, not a good solution, and um, or yeah, what what to do with it? So there are strict um, in Germany. There are strict rules how to deal with it, and that makes it even like you said, even more expensive to 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 apply the technology. So yeah, it's it's um, it's considered, and not really. I, I I haven't seen a solution or a good solution that even makes it economic or more economic yet. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I hope that answers the said? question. <laughs> I have many questions and I don't want to take up all the time before everyone else gets questions. So I'll wait my turn for the next ones. Perfect. Thank you. And again, just if there's any other ones that don't get uh, answered, because we're probably we're hitting 11 pretty soon here and I don't want to keep anybody too late, but uh, just feel free to reach out. So yes. sure had asked uh, in slide line, Alberta doesn't seem to show any resources for hydrogen. And since we're looking at career op openings, how would this affect potential opportunities for job seekers? Could you speak to this? And I guess I would like to add a little bit onto that. 
what do you think would be your tips if you're trying to get into hydrogen, if you're trying to, you know, get employed in this industry, what, what do you think would be your starting point? What kind of skills do you think are, are needed right now? Or, or where do you think is the, the best places to go? Uh, any, any information would be useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was quite confused that Alberta, um, Saskatchewan is listed here. Um, but yeah, so both the same, maybe they just had some issue with place, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, but they say that, uh, and you, I can only recommend, look into the um, Canadian hydrogen strategy. It will give you, give you more ideas on where Canada is um, staying right now and um, where you guys want to go to. And um so I think this is a good starting point to understand what's what's going on in Canada um, in terms of the hydrogen um, situation in the, in the country because it's quite different from what what's like in Germany. Like I said, in Germany it's rather like oh my god, we we have issues to even have the hydrogen and we don't know how. And in Canada it's like yeah, we have plenty, we have um, plenty of options to do that and. Um, we'll just export it. And in Germany, it's really like, okay, we want to export um, our knowledge on it. We want to export our um, technology because electrolyzers and, and fuel cells are quite well known in Germany and we have um, good experiences on that. And uh, this is what they want to export and Canada wants to do the same. So uh, what does that mean uh, job-wise? Mm, I would say that currently a lot is at least in Germany, and I assume for Canada the same, is going on in the, in the organization, in, in the organizational uh, phase. So people are starting right now to develop projects, to develop the strategies, to, to when the strategy is developed, to even look deeper into, okay, so where do we need funds and what makes sense? So I assume there are quite some job openings so that you can look on, on the funding level and steering this um, where, where um, the investments are going. Then we have the investor side. Investors are looking into hydrogen topics as well. They want to, they want to, um, have projects they want to invest in projects so that could also be an option where you can search for for jobs and then um project developers or big country uh, companies like um air liquid who are now building their first pilot projects in electrolyzers for the others like i said already uh, already, sorry, uh, Canada is one of the 10th um, best producers or largest producers in the world. So um, you, you currently, today you already produce hydrogen in large amounts. And I think that was shown also, ah, sorry, that was shown here. So most of them from natural gas because the natural gas industry is quite huge in, in Canada. So you do conversions there. So, but if you want to look into green hydrogen, then of course there are the developers in, in Canada. They are, I know, also interested in those projects and they want to add electrolyzers, but the, the cases are still a little bit difficult, but job openings are increasing um, Yeah, in the last year, I would say. And... Um, then the the really the the producers of fuel cells and and um, electrolyzers in Canada they are also yeah expanding and need more manpower. So those are the ones where I say, okay, have a look onto that if there are job openings in this field. So gas um, industry because they are currently converting shell, for instance. They're investing into hydrogen right now. Um, then um, the, the manufacturers, electrolyzer fuel cell, then organ, on the organization um, stage, uh, so governmental, many, um, I would say, are also looking into 
local decarbonization strategies, something like that. Even renewable energy companies. I hope. I'm just going to put that out there that it's always a conversation. Oh, yeah. Right. The energy companies. I forgot them. <laughs> Sorry for that. Yeah. The energy companies, the big ones. Yeah. The well, F, and, for instance. Yeah, exactly. Andrea and I actually met because we were colleagues at uh, ABO Wind. So I can tell you that, like, from even the industry that I know here in Alberta, there's always talk about hydrogen in the renewable energy sector. Um, so we actually have a fair amount of questions left, and we're already at our our end point. Andrea, I don't know how much time you have left, but uh, I was kind of hoping maybe Al, Yoen, Michael, and Zane, are you guys okay to reach out to Andrea afterwards? Or I, I can try and get some of these questions answered. Lots of them. Michael said yes. Okay. Um, Al's question was regarding the pipelines again, um, not being able, I can't, he said, I'm not sure what it's like in Germany, but it's been a nightmare to build any sort of infrastructure in Canada, especially pipelines. I cannot imagine being able to build enough new pipeline capacity in Canada in a practical time frame to enable this industry. Comments? Yes, absolutely. Because uh, yeah, <laughs> Germany is so, like, uh, the, the, the population is really, really dense. So, so many people live on one square kilometer. And so everybody's like, and eh, no, I don't want to have it in my backyard. You, you again, you want to dig holes and yeah. you want to build infrastructure. Oh God, no, don't do that. So yeah, it's an issue. And then you have the, the wind parks right next to your house. Oh no. So oh, yeah, um, of course, yeah, Th those are really big issues. That's absolutely right. So we need to find solutions. And this is actually the focus um, to solve it with the existing, with the existing pipelines. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And then the last question uh, for, was from Ewan. Are you aware of offshore wind generation farms coupled with electrolysis and desalinization plants? Yes, I am aware. Germany is currently also making a pilot in this direction. It's, I think, Siemens oh, is yes, the main awesome. investor. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, yeah. well, Zane and Michael are probably going to reach out to you for the last final questions. But thank you so much, Andrea, and thank you for everyone for joining. And again, I really encourage you, if you see names pop up in here in the chat and, and just reach out to Andrea herself, uh, this has been wonderful and I'm so informative. I mean, I'm new to, to, to hydrogen. I feel like most people here are, are new to hydrogen. So there's, there's lots to learn and I would really love to have you back to kind of answer some of these questions that, you know, may, might need a few more months to, to get to. Um, thank Definitely. you. Definitely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, if just for everybody, again, I'm going to repeat it. Our YouTube channel is the Goldmine Project. So you can find this video here. It might not be uploaded today, but it will eventually. But uh, if not, I hope to see you guys again soon and have a great weekend. <laughs> a Thank weekend you. Here and in Germany. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you <too. laughs> All right. Well, say goodbye, Andrea. You have the hosting privileges, so I guess oh, yeah. stop the recording and and yeah, end everything. <laughs> mm, how do I do this? I, I just say end, right? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, friends. Bye. <laughs>